So this is video problem 2. We are considering the configuration of a line charge and we will use Gauss law to determine the electric field intensity of a uniform line charge density in free space. Afterwards we will also determine the associated electric potential. So this is the configuration. We are considering an infinite uniform line charge density and we assume that it's positive and located in free space with free space permittivity epsilon naught. The objective is to determine the field at this observation point P. We first introduce uh, the two coordinate systems, the rectangular XYZ and cylindrical R5Z coordinate systems so that the line charge coincides with the z-axis of these systems. The location of the observation point P is given by these uh, coordinates R5 and Z or alternatively with this position vector that you can see here. First we postulate that the electric field due to this uh, line charge density is in the radial direction specified by this unit vector and that the magnitude uh, only depends on the distance away from the charge density. And first we would like to argue why this is so. And let's take the coordinates first. Because the line charge density is infinite and uniform along Z, the field cannot depend on the Z coordinate. Now what about phi coordinate, which is the angular coordinate? To this end, consider this surface S upon which our observation point is located. And then you can consider, for instance, those observation points that are located on this surface in this particular manner. Because of the cylindrical symmetry of our uh, charge configuration, all of those points, they will see the same charge distribution and thus the field will be independent of the phi coordinate. So we conclude that the field only depends on this radial uh, coordinate, which is the distance from the charge density to the observation point. Now we move to the components. We see that it only has a radial component. So we can ask, why is there no tangential component? First, a phi component. So if there is such a component at this particular point, you can see it's tangential to the surface. Again, due to the symmetry, you would also have it here. You would also have it here. And you will also have it here. That means that there will be a circulation of the electric field intensity along this circular part. But because we are dealing with electrostatic fields, the circulation of this field must be equal to zero along any closed path C, and thus we cannot have any phi component here. Assume that there is a Z component in this particular point over here, pointing along Z direction. A little further away, uh, it will also point along Z direction, but because it has to decay as you move away from the line charge density, this is indicated by the uh, shorter arrow here. Now you can imagine this rectangular curve and the existence of these Z components will again give you a circulation along this rectangular curve which is non-zero. And that cannot be the case and thus there cannot be any tangential component. So the field indeed only has a radial component and the magnitude of this radial component is only dependent on the distance to the observation point. This also means that we can use Gauss law that you can see here which basically states that the outward flux of the electric field through a closed surface S is equal to the total charge enclosed by the surface divided with free space permittivity. And our surface S is what we call Gaussian surface. So let us now uh, try to figure out uh, the specifics of our Gaussian surface and in particular let us uh, figure out what the right DS element is uh, for this particular surface. So we are considering the cylindrical surface that you can see here 
Gauss law uses a closed Gaussian surface, as you can see uh, up here. So our cylindrical surface is seen to consist of this top circular surface that has this ds element which is in the positive z direction. It also consists of this bottom circular surface that has the ds element in the negative z direction and to close it we also need to include this round part which has the ds element in the outward radial direction. So our closed surface is actually composed of these three surfaces but because the electric field is radial as you can see here there will be no contribution to this integral for top and bottom surfaces because your ds elements are orthogonal to the electric field when you dot them as you should on the left hand side of gauss law the product will be equal to zero so we only have a contribution from the round part of the surface and for this we can use the figure here to identify the correct uh, ds element so it is essentially the surface area that you can see here so basically dz times the arc uh, length over here which is r times d phi and everything is in the outward radial direction so this is the correct ds element so now we have all the ingredients to determine the electric field intensity at this particular observation point P. This is the electric field, this is our DS element, and here you can see our Gaussian surface, which has the length L along Z direction. So let's plug everything inside of our Gauss law. We are integrating over this round part of our cylindrical surface, to cover all points, phi would have to go from 0 to 2 pi, and we are integrating along z direction from some arbitrary constant, z0, where our surface begins, to z0 plus L, which is the end point along z of our Gaussian surface. This is the electric field, this is our ds element, and this is the right hand side of our Gauss law r unit vector dotted with r unit vector gives of course unity there is the electric field and the distance here that can be taken outside of this integral and you will get this particular result 2 pi r times l is essentially the surface area of our cylindrical uh, gaussian surface the round part of it and on the right hand side we see the total charge which is simply the line charge density times the length of the surface divided with free space permittivity we can easily isolate the magnitude of the electric field and write the final vector uh, result down here so we can see that the electric field is in the radial direction it's directly proportional to the magnitude of the line charge density and it's inversely proportional to the distance between the line charge density and the observation point. So having determined the electric field intensity for our line charge density, we would next like to determine the electric potential due to this uh, charge configuration. So it is essentially this line integral of the electric field from some reference point to our observation point. It is clear to see that our observation point is simply the distance from the charge density to the observation point, the radial distance, and in fact all points along this uh, surface here will have the same potential, which is why the surface is called the equipotential surface. Now in this particular case, as you will see shortly, the reference point of zero potential cannot be chosen uh, to be located at infinity and you would need to specify it at some finite distance R0 from your charge distribution. You can also see this reference point here. Our path of integration could for instance be this red path but because this integral is path independent we can also choose the blue path that I have specified here and for this blue path this is the differential uh, length or differential displacement that we will have to use in our integral for potential. When I plug the electric field and the DL element 
I get this result here. You can see the electric field and our DL element here. When we dot our unit vectors with each other, you get unity. We take out the constants that we can take out and the rest is simply the evaluation of this integral of 1 over r. This integral is the natural logarithm of r and when you plug in the integration limits you arrive at the final expression for the potential given by the expression down here. So you can see that there is a logarithmic dependence on the distance from the line charge density to the observation point. We can also note finally here that if you specify R0 to be infinity, you will get an infinity, infinitely large potential at all other points except at infinity. And this is of course not physical, which is also the reason why you cannot specify the reference point of zero potential at infinity, and you have to specify it at some finite distance away from your line charge. We are now essentially done with all our tasks and we also have a few tasks for you. We would like you to verify whether these expressions derived here satisfy the fundamental postulates of electrostatics. Also verify that the electric field is the negative gradient of the derived potential. The results here were derived by using Gauss law, but compare this solution with that in example 3.4 in our textbook, where a more general uh, expression for the electric field due to a line charge density is used. And also derive the corresponding expressions for a line source displaced to some finite distance r' prime from the origin. Thank you very much for your attention.